for your students, I would say that my target audience is the African American community. For me, I would say my target audience is anyone who can read. I truly believe that this whole marketing targeting thing gets a little out of hand. If you have a heart attack, it really doesn't matter what color you are. If you need a liver, it really doesn't matter what color you are. If you're heartbroken by a young man, it really doesn't matter what color you are. You just want to find the answer. If the story's amazing, who cares? But for purposes of marketing, the African American community and the multicultural community, because me myself, I'm a first generation American from Curacao. My mother was born in Curacao, and that's the environment I grew up in, which is a Caribbean East Coast culture. And trying to infuse that into what I've learned from the Midwest. And I will say, though, that I did a lot of research at Michigan State University so that I could know my area. If you are a journalist and you move to, say, Iowa, Make sure you go to a library, preferably the university library, and look up someone else's dissertation on what's going on with the people in that area because you'll know the history. History moves from generation to generation. So that's a good way to immerse yourself, especially if you're in the media and you're trying to understand the people that you're reporting on. You have to know the background. Here in Michigan, um, who would have known coming from New York that uh, most of the people here are from the South? So, I mean, that was an eye-opening experience. Who would have known that here in Lansing, we have a huge international um, population due to the refugee population. And I thought it was so amazing um, when I first got here, the Vietnamese were coming in. So now, I go to the Vietnamese church. I have an Ao Dai because that's my interest. Um, before I got to Michigan, I worked at the United Nations as well. So my interests are all over the place and I try to infuse that into what I'm writing about so that we can remove ourselves and be far understanding into what it is that we're dealing with in our own community. One of the reasons that um, minority newspapers have been successful though is that because they do tell stories that maybe sometimes the mainstream press ignores or they tell it from a point of view that uh, is different than perhaps the mainstream press does and the mainstream daily newspaper that has to go out and cover every fire and uh, almost every car crash and that kind of thing has a different mission. You can tell stories that are more in depth and more issue oriented and um, it's, give people information they really need. And give families closure. I think that the main part about what I love about doing what I do is that I get to give families closure. Not only do I get to give families closure, but I get to sort of superstar the survivors, the normal everyday survivors. We just did a story on a family of three, young family that was in a car accident, the Thomas family, and they were rear-ended by a drunk driver. And by all accounts, looking at the vehicle, they should not be here. And according to um, the wife, she was in the back seat with the baby without her seatbelt on. And she was ejected from the vehicle on Grand River. These stories, you don't hear about exactly what happened. You may see the mainstream newspaper beginning, but you hardly ever see the end, which is, which is one of the things that you know, young reporters should really be looking at too. Where is the end? 
what happened to those people? What happened to that bus that disappeared? What happened to, you know, the guy who was in the motorcycle accident? Who, what happened to the people who passed away and gave their organs to someone else? Where are those people at? You know, so I think it's an amazing opportunity also um, for us to actually be more creative in our reporting. I, I wish, I wish that there were more investigative reporters. I wish that we had more time to dwell really deeply into community issues, but the industry moves so fast and it's not, it's not quite the same anymore. So the reason why African-American newspapers or just smaller niche community newspapers do so well is because we feature people like you. So. And what you do both print publication and also on the web. So you started that early, really. And very uh, early. Very early. And um, how often do you publish? And you have to sell your own advertising. You're I a one-man band. I am a one-man band. I'm looking to make it into a nine-piece symphony, you know? <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's very interesting. Um, not only am I a one-man band, but I do an immense amount of volunteer work. And I find myself now, in the last six months, after doing this for 10 years, the New Citizens Press started in February of 2002. We just had our 10 year anniversary. We deliver every two weeks. We have never been late through sickness, through pregnancies and death. And you know why? Because we have an amazing system called the internet. And the reason why I could do this by myself is because when I first started the newspaper, nobody in the community wanted to help me because I wasn't from the community. So I went to the internet. Like I said, the financial issues that are going on in Texas are the same financial issues that are going on in Michigan. So I created this whole syndicated columnist and people were excited. They're like, hey, you know, you saw my, my article on the internet and it's being printed. So now I'm a syndicated columnist for the New Citizens Press in Lansing, Michigan. And then I live in Texas. So I'm excited about it. They're excited about it. I have a like an artist a columnist from Columbus, Ohio, who does, uh, she does like an Ann Landers type of article, I mean column, and she's amazing, and I really love that. I have uh, Sharon Fox, who does recipes, and they're really amazing, and they're so tasty, just looking at the pictures makes your mouth water. So you really want to try to get people who were just as excited about being featured as you are excited that you have content. Are there, um, oh, how many pages do you normally publish? Is that dictated by how many ads you can sell? Do you put stories on the internet you don't put into the paper? How do you make all those decisions? I do put stories on the internet that don't go into the paper and they don't go into the paper because we deliver bi-weekly we deliver bi-weekly so if something comes up that's fantastic and amazing like uh pistachios or declared uh whatever they uneatable <laughs> we put that up if something goes you know, astray uh, in world history. We put that up. Um, so we we also have the the great opportunity to do really interesting pieces from websites like ProPublica or NewAmericaMedia.org, which is another organization that provides content. It's interesting that you have all these online sources but what irritates me the most about media is when another media source tells me that print is going out of business and they invited me into the room to buy something that they're selling to me 
and I will quickly tell them that I can't, I'm sorry, I can't support what you're doing. I said, when the internet goes down, the paper will be there. And no matter what anyone says to me about print going, you know, bye-bye, it's not. It's going to be around for a very long time because a website can go down at the drop of a dime. If, if the person goes away, the person goes away. But what I did do with my pregnant belly and my child in stroller was camp out at the Michigan Historical Library and tell them how important it was for them to archive my newspaper. And so they have almost every edition that I ever printed because that was important to me. People need to have an opportunity to go back and look and, and to create, create a sense of history that's searchable. We don't have that, you know, who, so when Mr. and Mrs. Thomas's children's grandchildren are looking for them, they will know exactly what happened and how grateful they should be to be here because they, they almost did not exist. And I watch these shows on TV, um, Who Am I, or, and, and I watch how the library is such an amazing resource. And I tell you what, they're not going to the internet to find that stuff. They're going to the library and it's on paper and they have to use little gloves because it's so delicate. So print is here to stay. In terms of the community work that you do, I know that you have worked with the people who have lost someone to violence and you held an event that honored them and gave them the compassion of the community. Um, your role as publisher is really not just to put out a news publication, is it? It's not. And I am, um, I think that for me, just even talking about it, everybody needs to find what they're passionate about. And I'm truly passionate about helping people mentally get over or work through what bothers them. And just giving them the opportunity to do that. We got one person who struggled with that issue for years of, you know, her father being killed, who's getting her GED. It's all about what, you know, I always ask them, so, so what is it that you haven't done that you want to do because this issue has been stifling you your whole life? She said she wanted to get her GED. I picked her up from work and drove her to the GED place. And sometimes, we need to support each other just as people. And just because you're a reporter or you're a publisher, it doesn't mean that you are not human. And sometimes even though you need to separate yourself from what you're doing at work, that does not mean that you can't go and find the same exact situation outside of work and help somebody else. I, I just, I, but I find myself now thinking about how I can help people on a larger, smaller scale because I am a one-man show, band, and baby bottle washer, and all of that other stuff that comes along with being a mother, a wife, a publisher. Um, I have to really start focusing on the New Citizens Press as an entity and even though I love doing that, now I'm finding ways to integrate it more. Um, like Poetry in the City. Poetry in the City is an amazing um, program that we have where we do poetry on the Capitol steps. And poetry is such an amazing opportunity for people to just get up and say what they want to say. And it doesn't have to be this long Walt Whitman poem. It could be a quote that you heard that really impacted you. The point is that you get to go and speak on the Capitol steps, which you never have that opportunity. That's the main point of poetry in the city. And through poetry in the city, we have a program called Read to Succeed, Write to Ignite. And that program is 
to give students the sources and dictionaries. And I don't care if they're in the second grade, third grade, on up. If they have the thesaurus at some point in time, they'll open it. As I especially give them out to children that use a lot of profanity and tell them you need to really find another way. It is so much better to tell someone that they are a buffoon than to use another word that you really will probably get in trouble from for. No one's going to respect you. And besides that, it doesn't do anything to your vocabulary skills. And I think that it's, I think it's working. Um, I love working with the little people. Uh, Pleasant View School has a journalism program and I work with them all the time. We're going to be featured in the Lansing Business Monthly. And my job was to find a place to take a picture. I went right to the school for the probably one of the first times they'll have children with someone in the Lansing Business Monthly, which is a very, uh, very business oriented uh, uh, publication. But my goal is to get them exposure. Can you imagine what it's going to be like for them as young journalists to open this magazine up with all these guys with suits on to to see themselves in this spread with with Mrs. Risper the motivation lady that's what that's what they call me but um, it's it's an amazing opportunity to get them involved and they gave back to me because they raised they raised money from a popcorn sale and purchased 250 thesauruses and dictionaries for the Read to Succeed Right to Ignite program. And that's amazing. Vice, because my concern is that many of the students that I have in this economy might want to think about starting their own publication rather than to go to work for someone else. How do you know if you have that spark within you and how do you get over the fear and insecurity that, oh, I'm not ready, oh, I don't know enough, how did you find the courage to start your own publication and what advice would you give them? I'm just crazy. <laughs> I would have never thought in my wildest dreams that I would start a newspaper. The interesting thing is that people will try to diminish what I do and that's okay. That's really okay because I own ink. And owning ink is an amazing responsibility. However, don't start a publication if you don't really, really have the passion for doing it. There are long hours. <laughs> there are people who say they can lay out papers but can't. You have to know every single aspect of it, including how to write invoices, including how to sell advertisement, and you must do it. And before you even start, there has to be something that's missing in your community. And what's missing, you better be putting a spin on it with some cherries and whipped cream and sprinkles, and it better be good and it better be something that people actually want to read. It's not about you. It's about the community that you are serving.